I'm going to address concerning about Greek and Hebrew scholars. So the reason why people do not believe in the King James Bible is because they believe it is inaccurate in Greek and Hebrew. We believe in the King James Bible that it is a perfect, pure word of God because if you don't believe in a perfect Bible and if you don't believe every word in the King James Bible is perfect, then how do you not know some of the things that it says is giving you the right doctrine, the right teaching? A word change can change a whole doctrine. That is why we demand a perfect book, a perfect Bible, which is the King James Bible. So the common argument against the King James Bible is that it is inaccurate. In what way? In Greek and Hebrew. So because it is considered to be inaccurate... <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> wow. There was some dust there, sorry. So because the King James Bible... It is considered to be inaccurate in Greek and Hebrew. So then what you're going to notice is that you're going to see some amateur who claims that the Greek says this and the Hebrew says this, and then you tell them this. Okay, then tell, uh, translate to me into Hebrew that uh, your mom got into a car accident in Los Angeles, and he can't translate that. These people will try to correct your Bible with Hebrew, and they can't speak Hebrew themselves, That's these right. people. I bet you they don't even know the word hello and thank you in Hebrew. Okay, so these people who act all smart and, not, and they'll act all nonchalant, all you have to have is some guy with a white beard and a bald head and say, oh, Greek and Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew. He can't speak Greek and Hebrew, that guy. So you just have to have some uh, arrogant idiots, and these guys are arrogant idiots who attack your King James Bible. Not all of them are. Many people are just sincere people, and they don't know what they're talking about. But there are some out there who deliberately make an effort to attack the King James Bible. And they will even write a book on it. So these kind of people, they can't even speak to you Greek and Hebrew. And they will claim, well, the Greek word is this, the Hebrew word is that. So we're going to tackle this subject. The first thing, the reason why this is incorrect is because they're going to resort to lexicons. These people wouldn't know Greek and Hebrew if they didn't know certain terms that their scholars taught them first. Or certain dictionaries, lexicons, or interlinears. So they will have these things which they call lexicons, interlinears, as well as dictionaries. And then concordances. So all these things they will use to try to debunk your King James Bible reading. That it is an inaccurate translation. Well, they wouldn't say it's inaccurate if they didn't have these books to begin with. So they're picking and choosing words out of the books. But if they want to go by these scholars, <clears throat> the reason why you cannot go by Greek and Hebrew lexicons is based off of three reasons. The first reason is because, one, a Greek and Hebrew lexicon, dictionary, interlinear, blah, 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 they have multiple meanings. All you have to do is don't let them scare you when they start to use some Hebrew and Greek word. All you have to do is look up that Hebrew and Greek word yourself, and it's guaranteed to have several definitions. It's guaranteed to have several definitions. Now, what they do is that they will pick the definition that they like, and then they will use that to correct your King James Bible. There was this Muslim who thought that he could st uh, stomp us with... Hebrew, he just said, well, you know, the, the King James Bible, it says that. It says house, something like that. It says house, but in Hebrew, it means bread. And I just simply said back, oh, well, yeah, because Hebrew has more than one definition. It can mean bread, but it can also mean house as well. And then he was like, uh, yeah. And then he went to a different argument after that. So <laughs> this guy, see, he doesn't even know Hebrew and Greek. So all you have to do is just point, him, point out to them that there's a different definition for that and that they're picking and choosing. But here's another reason why you cannot trust uh, lexicons and dictionaries. It's because you got to understand that these are statements of what men think. And you got to realize who are the ones who gave you these definitions. So they would say scholar, scholar, scholars, but don't let that scare you. It doesn't change the fact right. he's still a human Amen. who makes mistakes. So when you think of it that way, then you can see that these guys are not so hot shot as you think that they are. They just act hot shot. That's all they do. They just act hot shot, but they're not. So these people, they're only humans. And you cannot trust man as the final authority, obviously. 
Who's the final authority? It is God Almighty. So these men are fallible. Now they're going to say, well, the KJV translators, they were men too. Well, we'll come to them later, okay? Let's come to you first. So the thing is, is that they will use men as their basis of the definition. Now are men dependable? They're not. Do you know why? Men can be wrong because they can contradict each other. Now think about this. If they can contradict each other, think about that. Does that mean then, if I were to pick, how many lexicons and concordances are out there around the world? There's a lot of them. What if you were to pick up a lexicon and concordance that has a definition that contradicted a different lexicon? That's right. So that's what you can do. The first problem with this, why you can rely on the King James Bible and not lexicons and concordances, the first reason is because of contradictions. So use that first. It's contradictions. You're going to find out that, well, you know, uh, Strong's Concordance, Yaw Yin, it means uh, alcoholic wine. So in the Bible, it is actually liquor that they were drinking and not grape juice. Well, then you just go to Young's Concordance, and actually in Young's Concordance, Yaw Yin will, or whatever you want to call it, Yaw Yin or whatever, that it would refer to grape juice. Oh, so much for Yaw Yin. And, that, and they would know that word Yaw Yin, then they sooner know the word thank you in Hebrew, these people. <laughs> So these people are just stupendously hilarious, these people. <clears throat> Don't let them scare you with their Greek and Hebrew interpretation. I mean, I bet you that if some of you are uh, native in your language with Greek and Hebrew, you know more than they do. And then you scare them if you talk to them in Greek and Hebrew. So these people act all high and mighty and competent because they assume you don't know Greek and Hebrew. That's their classic way of having false confidence in themselves. So the first problem is con contradictions. If they pull up a Briggs lexicon to try to prove their definition, you just pull up a Strong's Concordance. And if they're going to use a Strong's Concordance, then you just use a Young's. And then if they're going to use a Young's, then all you have to use is Kittles. And trust me, you're going to find a definition that will defend your belief. So how you defend the King James Bible is you just look at all the lexicons and concordances. When you look at all of them, there's going to be bound to be a definition that will support the King James Bible reading. Why? What? Do you think these KJV translators just made up a word out of thin air? Well, you know, we'll just put this word right here because we're stupid and dumb and we'll just make up a Greek and Hebrew word? Of course not. These guys were uh, scholars from Oxford, Westminster, Cambridge. So before you so nonchalantly and stupidly say that, oh, that they did it that as an error, Hey, man, you better look at all the concordances, lexicons, and definitions before you spit something dumb out of your mouth. I guarantee you this, too. Once they spit something dumb out of their mouths about what the interpretation should be, go back to them the very next day and see if they remember what they said. <laughs> they made it up. See, they just made it up, these people. These guys, especially in debates, they make things up as they go. That's, right. That's the kind of wicked heinous, evil people some of these debaters are. Again, a lot of people don't know about this issue. They're just sincere people. Yeah. But, but concerning these people who make a career and money off of attacking the King James Bible, these guys who act like Greek and Hebrew scholars, I show zero respect, absolute zero respect for these kind of heretics. Okay, another problem with these lexicons is not only that, but a second problem is... <laughs> Let me read uh, a quotation right here. Trevor V. Evans, and his work is found in Verbal Syntax in the Greek Pentateuch, published for the Oxford University Press. He pointed out this, By way of further contrast, my own views are somewhat different again. I accept with Porter, a different scholar, that the perfect essentially, essentially expresses stativity, but agree with Fanning, that this is to be understood as an action sart value, not an independent aspect. Such contradictory responses clearly show the need for further, further study of the Greek perfect. It remains one of the verbal system's most difficult problems, and the new approaches just sketched raised their own share of questions. Now, if you paid attention right here, you know what the problem is right here? The problem is, is that this Greek scholar admitted right here that there was a different Greek scholar that he was contradicting with. So he was arguing his point of view. So here's the thing. How do we know that your point of Hebrew and Greek is correct? That's right. That's good. 
See, it's, it's all a matter of, well, it interprets it this way, this interprets that way. So you can use whatever interpretation you want with Greek and Hebrew then. As long as it sounds Greek and Hebrew, then you win. So that's the problem with these people. It is a matter of fact that things contradict each other. Another problem, which is very plain, and I don't know why they don't think about this, is that the Greek and Hebrew during biblical times, you've got to realize this, they are very different from how you would do Greek and Hebrew today. That is a matter of fact. Now, they would try to revive the Hebrew and Greek language from biblical times, but my goodness, friend, you're going to have to go back thousands of years. You're going to have to go back thousands of years. So how do you know what they spoke was the real Greek and Hebrew of that time? Not only that, use your head now. The KJV translators during like hundreds of years ago, their understanding of Greek and Hebrew could be different from yours today. So they have a reason for translating it that way. they got to think about that. Here are several quotes right here. This is by J.P. Green Sr. He's a Greek and Hebrew scholar who's the author of the Interlinear Bible from the Trinitarian Bible Society in London. Quote, in fact, it is doubted that the New Testament writers themselves used the aorist in the strict or restricted way that Greek grammarians interpret it today. Now, did you see that? He actually said that the New Testament writers, the originals, they wrote things in Greek differently in a certain aorist aorist tense from the Greek grammarians today. Here's another one, John Chadwick. He's a leading expert of lexicons from the University of Cambridge. He quoted right here, a fault of LSJ, that's the little Scott Jones uh, Greek English lexicon, one of, the, one of the famous lexicons. A fault of LSJ is failure to allow for the semantic value of the present tense system, which was perhaps less well understood in the 19th century. So you see right here that even in the earlier centuries, their understanding was a lot more different from today. Here's another one from linguist Evans. He laments the undoubtable fact that, quote, long ignored problems which lie at the heart of the, ver the Greek verbal system and thus at the heart of the Greek language itself. The purpose of this paper is to demonstrate that we have barely begun the process of unraveling these problems. So you see right here that they admit that the Greek and Hebrew interpretations of those days was definitely, definitely different from back then. Uh, these documentations can be found by John Chadwick, Lexic Lexicographica Graeca from the Oxford University Press, 1996, page 21. Jay Green's The Interlinear Bible at London, Trinitarian Bible Society, 2nd edition, 1985, at Roman numeral, page 14. And then uh, Bernard Taylor, as well as John A. A. L. Lee, Peter R. Burton, and Richard E. Whitaker in their book, Biblical Greek Language and Lexic Lexicography, at Grand Rapids, Michigan, William B. Erdman's Publishing Company, 2004, pages 199 and 200. So you see right here that you can't trust the Greek and Hebrew of today because how do you really know that they're the same as back then? Not only that, during the KJV translator's timeline, it was also different from their understanding. I mean, you got to realize this, friend, is that, so we got to understand that the second problem is that Greek and Hebrew is, when they say Greek and Hebrew, they're talking about their own Greek and Hebrew in La La Land of modern century not the real Greek and Hebrew during the New Testament writers. If they're going to be honest, they're going to admit that they don't know, 100%, if they're very honest. Number three, so Greek and Hebrew is different compared to the Old Testament and the New Testament. Number three, here's another problem. So before... Judas big fat white lie lies about we got more manuscripts today so compared to the KJV translator so they don't know what they were talking about and as soon as he lies shoots off his lying mouth which God recorded at the judgment seat of Christ every time he lied in hundreds of debates so he'll probably be naked as a jailbird at the judgment seat of Christ if he is saved but this guy when he lies like that and then you got these it, this idiot from Dallas Theological Seminary you got Dan Wallace and John An John Ankerberg these guys shooting off their mouth about, man we got man more manuscripts compared to the KGV translators today, and they will use their own Greek and Hebrew interpretation. 
the idiocy of their arguments is that they're going to have to honestly admit that one, that's true that they have more compared to the KJV translators back then. They found more new things recently. But when you look at the New Testament evidence, all, all Greek manuscripts support the KJV's line of manuscript 90 to 99% of the time. So, what, so just because you found more recent manuscripts, it just built up the evidence even more. But the second thing is this. They don't have the manuscripts that the KJV translators had back then. So you got to understand this. The reason why you can't depend upon these definitions is Dr. So-and-so, when he wrote on the concordance, did not have that Greek or Hebrew or those ancient manuscripts that the KJV translators had. Think about that. When you read the translators to the readers, these books included, quote, a Dutch rhyme yet extent from the 900s, a French of, quote, which translation there be many copies yet extent from the 1300s, and another one, many English Bibles in written hand translated from the 1300s. Wow. You got to also understand this, the KJV translators use multiple translation from all kinds of languages, not Greek and Hebrew. They use all languages from all around the world. These included uh, the Geneva French from 1587 to 1588, Olivetan from 1535, Passores from 1588, the Spanish Valencia 1478, Pinel from 1553, De Reynas from 1569, De Valera from 1602, Diodati from 1607, Hutters, Nuremberg Polyglot, 1599, and the Antwerp Polyglot. That's pretty rare right there. So these rare other manuscripts, they don't have as well. So what are they going to do about that? What are they going to do about that? As a matter of fact, I'm not going to do it in this video, but there are certain authors who actually argued certain Greek manuscripts that were shipped to the churches where they were translating. And those certain Greek manuscripts are not mentioned in today's uh, manuscript evidence list. So those were extent. Think about it. Scholars are going to admit that during the medieval era that there may have been a lot of manuscripts lost. They're going to have to admit that. So that means that if those manuscripts are lost and they don't have access to them, then those guys during the medieval era, during the, during the Shakespearean time, during King James timeline, they had manuscripts they don't have today. So before you act like you're smarter than the KJV translator and you say, well, the Greek and Hebrew interpretation is this, then you just tell them this. Well, do you have this manuscript, that manuscript, this manuscript, that manuscript? They don't have a single manuscript. All they have is the word of doctor so-and-so. Yeah. That's the same thing like you're going to take this doctor's word for it. You all poke fun. You, you all poke fun at us Bible believers. You all poke fun at me. Oh, so you're going to take the word of this doctor so-and-so, what he says is true. Well, yeah, fair is fair. We're, uh, you guys have been doing it all this time, you hypocrite. Right. We've been taking the word of doctor so-and-so that this is a Greek and Hebrew interpretation. Well, you didn't even have these rare manuscripts, you stinking liar, you. Amen. And you don't know the Greek and Hebrew back then. Not only that, you contradict each other. That's all you have to do is listen to what James' big fat white lie says in Hebrew, in that verse, and find a different Greek and Hebrew scholar out there who gives a different interpretation. Then see him take it back. You know, this guy actually graduated with a doctorate from this university in Greek and Hebrew, so am I, am I supposed to take his word or you, Judas White? You pull, that, you pull that one up. And then when you hear John Anklebaum and Dan Walnuts giving these kind of silly arguments, and you do the same thing with their scholars. Why are you pounding them so hard? Why are you so mean, Pastor? Because they belittle King James-only people right. who love the King James Bible and believe in a perfect birth. Amen. They belittle people who believe every word of God is pure. Yeah. Yeah. They belittle you because you didn't graduate like they did. They, you didn't study Greek and Hebrew like they did. I'm catching them at their lies and their hypocrisy and show them zero respect. Amen. I show them absolute zero respect. If I would take off my socks and wave it in front of the camera, I would do that to show how much respect that I have for them. 